set? I think so. Well, good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Thanks for coming. Uh, please remember to fill out uh, the, our program evaluations and give us ideas you might have in regards to future topics and speakers. And also, please remember to fill out the attendance record in the back of the room. Uh, today, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Matthew Carfrey, who's our speaker. Uh, he is board certified in otolaryngology and also in neurotology. Uh, he did his otolaryngology uh, residency at Albany Medical College in Albany, New York, and then did a, a neurotology fellowship at the University of Virginia. He's currently in practice in uh, Des Moines, and he kindly accepted our invitation to come up today to, to uh, discuss vertigo. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Carfrey. Thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I just, does this, uh, I just want to check. Is this, yeah, we're good? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, So I'm going to, obviously vertigo is a relatively common complaint that we all encounter uh, with a, uh, a variety of causes. Um, obviously my, my focus is uh, the otologic perspective um, uh, or the neuro-otologic perspective. Neurotology happens to be the least known specialty in all of medicine I've discovered, uh, but essentially it's just the subspecialty focus of inner ear and uh, skull-based conditions in uh, otolaryngology. Um, uh, these are just uh, pictures of my two little girls. Uh, and as I um, as mentioned, um, I did my uh, medical school at the Iowa and my training out east. And in, I'm in uh, private practice here in uh, Des Moines. Uh, so our sense of balance is derived from a variety of uh, sensory inputs. Uh, our uh, visual system, proprioceptive inputs, as well as our vestibular system. Uh, and our put, put together our vestibular system, as well as these other sources of inputs, provide information for gait control and ocular stability. There are many, many causes of dizziness. For patients who come to see me with dizziness complaints, frequently during the course of the conversation, I have to point out that, you know, just think of any body part any organ, any body system, and when it's not working, you might be dizzy. Vertigo specifically implies uh, a loss of vestibular function, which could be either peripheral or central, and we'll talk about that more in the key of differentiating uh, peripheral and central causes of vestibulopathies. Uh, so as we all know, the uh, human um, labyrinth, the inner ear, is the most elegant and beautiful structure in the human body. It's a known fact. Uh, the vestibular labyrinth specifically involves five balance sensors. There's three semicircular canals and two otolithic organs, the utricle and saccule. The semicircular canals are not gravity sensitive. They sense angular movement only. And the otolithic organs sense linear acceleration. Um, the vestibular nerve has a superior branch and an inferior branch um, primarily. Uh, and they share space in the internal auditory canal with the facial nerve as well as uh, the hearing branch of the eighth nerve, the cochlear nerve. Balance requires, uh, is that mic giving me feedback or, I don't know, maybe I'll do this. We'll see if that works better. Um, so our sense of balance requires uh, information from a variety of inputs. Uh, our vestibular system, visual system, and a variety of proprioceptive inputs. Um, central causes of vestibulopathies usually interfere with the peripheral vestibular system's uh, ability to influence our posture, our gaze control, and autonomic function. And that disruption leads to uh, balance disturbances. And the goal of treatment for all these conditions in general is to restore the uh, balance of the uh, inputs in the vestibular system. Um, the first thing when seeing a patient with vestibular complaints or dizziness complaints is deter to determine, does this seem to be vertigo or is it something else? And that's not, that, determining that is not necessarily always 100% useful, but almost always it's a useful exercise. 
because whether they call it lightheadedness or dizziness or wooziness or foggy-headedness or you know, a dozen other things, it is unlikely for those complaints to be related to um, otologic or neurotologic or central causes of vestibulopathies. It can be related to, obviously, uh, medications, comorbidities, hypertension, uh, postural hypotension, uh, diabetes and peripheral neuropathies. Um, whereas vertigo, which is in general the sensation of movement when there is none, and almost always it's a, a spinning sensation, whether it's brief or more persistent, in general that's a neurologic cause of this balance disturbance or a peripheral cause, an ear-related cause. Uh, commonly these symptoms are associated with nausea and vomiting, although not always, um, and it results in an asymmetric impairment of sensory input uh, to the uh, the vestibular system centrally. So taking an accurate history of, um, of a patient's uh, symptoms um, is probably the most useful uh, diagnostic test. Uh, so and basically with a variety of questions, usually it, you can get to that, they answer either sooner and sometimes later. So is there a sensation of movement or not? Is it are you spinning or is the room spinning? How long does it last? Is this seconds, is it hour, minutes, is it hours, is it days? Is it all of the above? Uh, does it resolve right away? Do you feel fine later on that day or the next day? Is your balance off? Do you walk fine? Can you get around the house fine afterwards? Or how long does that take? Is there nausea and vomiting associated with the symptoms? Is there something that you can do to bring these symptoms on or to alleviate these symptoms? Are there specific head movements? When you get in bed, can you roll over in bed to the right or to the left without any difficulty? Do you always get vertigo when you roll over to the right and is it only mostly to the right? So people who've had these symptoms for a period of time, most folks will notice either immediately they'll come right out and say it or they'll say, you know, now you mention it, I can't sleep on my right side anymore. And those are usually really helpful indicators of what's going on. That, that, that's a quicker visit and a less complicated visit. Uh, so is the vertigo constant episodic or is it situational? Uh, has it happened before? Is this a one-time thing? And many times on discussing these things, it's happened before, except it was four years ago and they were on vacation. They had forgotten about it. Um, but it still might be relevant. Um, and then, of course, it's important to document any specific otologic symptoms or otologic history of ear surgery, pressure in one ear, tinnitus in one ear, the quality of the tinnitus. Anything that's happening in one ear and not the other is important. Um, anything that's happening in both ears, that, that may not be important at all. But if it's just one ear and it's specific, that ear and that ear has a few symptoms, then likely that that, that deserves uh, some specific attention to determine if there's a peripheral vestibulopathy. Um, and then sometimes when I can't get anywhere with the history and I'm not sure if the patient's there, I'm not sure why the patient's there, then it becomes what is the most bothersome feature of your symptoms? And sometimes it's a difficulty concentrating or it's headaches and I'm not always the most helpful person for those things or it's visual changes. Uh, but many times that at least directs what we work up and what we try to, f to focus on. Even things like short-term memory can be, clearly can be affected by people who have vestibulopathies and they have difficulty concentrating and that must, might be the most difficult feature of their symptoms and, you know, that's a place to start and kind of work backwards. So when talking about uh, vertigo, um, I, this chart I think is particularly helpful um, and I spend most of my time basically mentally putting patients somewhere on this chart. Uh, and primarily when it comes to the, the peripheral causes at, 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 the top of the, uh, at the top of this. Uh, so vertigo that lasts less than a, a minute associated with the head position is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo until proven otherwise. Vertigo which is recurrent with last, last 20 minutes to several hours is Meniere's disease until proven otherwise. And Vertigo that lasted for several days, it was terrible and was potentially associated with an ER visit uh, and then took a period of time, days, weeks, to gradual get some, gradually get some recovery. That's vestibular neuritis until proven otherwise. Uh, 
migraines follow no rules when it comes to the vertigo. That's the vertigo that's all over the place but still seems real. Um, and then uh, vertigo and disequilibrium certainly ca be caused by um, cell rebellion strokes and uh, transient ischemic attacks <clears throat> as well, but usually is associated with other focal neurologic symptoms. Um, both the diagnostic tests here and the exam um, elements are sort of listed by um, a degree of usefulness. So everyone gets a tuning fork exam and a microotoscopic exam. And if history dictates, then a patient would be worked up with the dix holpike exam to look for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Romberg testing and tandem Romberg testing can uh, uh, elicit uh, vestibular asymmetries. And the rest of these tests are of limited usefulness, I think, in, in the office, at least in, in my experience. They have specific applications. Many times it's, it's difficult to determine exactly how the eyes are reacting in these tests uh, without, um, well, dedicated recording devices. When it comes to uh, diagnostic testing, comprehensive audiograms are useful, MRIs frequently are helpful. CT scan of the temporal bone to determine, to, to look at bony anatomy depends on the specific complaints. Um, vestibular studies, particularly of ENG and, and caloric testing is, um, is frequently uh, helpful. But then there's some other more sophisticated testing that um, has some specific applications, but for the, the routine uh, vestibular patient, uh, usually I do not pursue. Uh, let's see here. So this, um, this chart just sort of talks about uh, nystagmus, and you know when it comes to uh, vertigo, obviously nystagmus is sort of the hall, uh, hallmark uh, physical exam finding. Um, there are two specific entities, of course, they have a very characteristic nystagmus. That's uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo involving the posterior semicircular canal, which we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, which has, with the affected ear down on, on a dix hall pike exam, has a uh, torsional down beating nystagmus. So it kind of goes up and down towards, towards the shoulder. And we'll look at that in a, in a diagram in a moment. Now patients can have posterior semicircular, or they can have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo that affects uh, the horizontal canal as well. And that's what's on uh, this line here. So, and that's elicited by a different finding. It happens enough that you should be aware of it. It's usually more severe than routine BPVV um, uh, and to do that, uh, the most, the easiest way to do that is to lean people back about 30 degrees and have them just turn their head about 45 degrees to, to either side. And there is a, a latency with that. It doesn't start right away, the nystagmus, but it's more severe, it's more lasting. Uh, they're more likely to get nausea and vomiting with that. Um, this last line, the central paroxysmal positional vertigo, just consider that positional vertigo is a non-localizing indicator of a vestibulopathy. Um, it, it would be hard to elicit on physical exam. It's more commonly elicited uh, when doing vestibular studies, when doing a, a, a VNG, a video nystagmogram. Um, I think it's very difficult on the basis of nystagmus to differentiate uh, vestibular neuritis from a cerebellar stroke. Um, with the exception that if it's a purely vertical nystagmus or a purely torsional nystagmus, vestibular neuritis or any other ear cause is not going to cause that. Um, even uh, fixation suppression that it, when a patient looks at an object, they should be able to suppress the amplitude and intensity of the nystagmus if it's a peripheral vestibulopathy. That's really tough to, I think, pick up on as well. And certainly, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's terribly realistic to differentiate who needs an imaging study and who doesn't based on what their nystagmus is doing in the ER. I would have a very hard time doing that. Um, in general, for the treatment of vertigo with you know, all its various causes, there's certainly no ideal uh, medication. There's no cure-all by any means. Um, in the acute setting, the goal is to control the symptoms um, and, uh, and they look for specific therapies for specific vestibu peripheral vestibular conditions and primarily ear conditions. Frequently, there's either specific medications or surgeries that could be used. 
our procedures, and for a variety of other conditions, then vestibular therapy is frequently helpful. Um, there are a variety of neurotransmitters which uh, can be um, taken advantage of to treat uh, acute vestibulopathies. Obviously, meclizine is a very commonly used medication. I think it's helpful in the acute setting. By the time people make it to me, one of the first things I commonly do if they're taking meclizine, particularly if they're on it all day, every day, is I take them off it. I try to wean them off the meclizine because it's a vestibular suppressant. And at that point, now that we're four weeks into their illness, um, it may be limiting their recovery or causing its own disequilibrium. Uh, in the acute setting, um, Valium is a very effective vestibular suppressant um, on, and on Dancitron as well, as well as uh, depending on how severe nausea and vomiting is, suppositories like Venergin can be helpful as well. And so in the acute setting, that's commonly it's, it's a Valium and on Dancitron or Valium on Dancitron and occasionally uh, Phenergan to control these symptoms. And I don't think I've met an acute vertigo that Valium can't at least give people symptomatic relief for. Um, so as I mentioned, for uh, peripheral vestibulopathy, it's important to focus on uh, history. Um, there should not be focal neurologic findings. Um, there's a few key features to the nystagmus. In general, if there's for a peripheral vestibulopathy, if, if the right ear is affected, then looking away to the left side will cause an increase in amplitude in that nystagmus. And you might see that on exam. If you see a little nystagmus and you ask him to look to the left or the right, if it's the right ear, the left side, you'll really notice the nystagmus quite clear. And if you look to the right, then uh, to the affected ear, then they may have no nystagmus. And that's even present, for example, with um, after surgeries for acoustic neuromas. Uh, in the immediate post-operative period, that's a way to determine how they're doing with their vertigo and their recovery, uh, is to look at the nystagmus. Um, in general, the nystagmus will fatigue um, and will decrease with fixation. Um, okay. Common causes of peripheral vestibulopathies, we'll cover all these and a few of the uncommon ones, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, Meniere's disease, trauma, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, there are a, a variety of atypical reasons for uh, developing labyrinthitis, a variety of atypical infectious causes. Uh, most commonly, it's either a viral etiology and, and that we don't have the answer for it or, um, um, or serious labyrinthitis. Um, there are a variety of unusual skull-based tumors that can involve the um, uh, vestibular nerve, internal auditory canal, as well as the inner ear. Um, so vestibular neuritis is an acute loss of peripheral vestibular function in, uh, um, on one side. It usually results in um, vertigo, associated nausea and vomiting, commonly lasts a period of days followed by a recovery of a period of weeks and sometimes months. Uh, it has a sudden onset um, and uh, Usually people will have, in the acute phase, they'll have some degree of uh, nystagmus, um, looking away from the affected ear. In general, technically, vestibular neuritis doesn't have hearing loss. That's um, labyrinthitis. But for the most part, they're, they're treated the, the same, and it's really just sort of style points if you recognize it's vestibular neuritis rather than labyrinth, labyrinthitis. Uh, treatment in the acute setting is uh, steroids, um, as well as supportive care, um, I tend to use uh, antivirals on the presumption that it's uh, uh, related to a viral etiology um, and the fact that it's relatively low risk with the antivirals, um, but there's a little bit of debate on that. Uh, labyrinthitis, as I mentioned, is all the symptoms of vestibular neuritis as well as uh, hearing loss, and the hearing loss can either be mild or profound. So it's both the vestibular as well as the cochlear uh, manifestations of uh, the condition uh, that defined as labyrinthitis. There's multiple etiologies. Almost always, it's not associated. It's not a secondary labyrinthitis associated with otitis media or meningitis. Um, almost most of the time, when we encounter labyrinthitis, is uh, uh, related to uh, uh, either idiopathic or presumed to be related to a viral etiology. Um, 
a lot of things I think used to be called Meniere's disease, um, and I think that we've over the the decades gotten better at defining what we think is Meniere's, and when we have when this group became smaller, what really is Meniere's disease? I think it became clearer as to what what helps these patients and what doesn't. So. Um, Meniere's disease, there's no perfect diagnostic test. Uh, it has the following hallmark features that all, almost always take a period of time to, to develop fully, and sometimes never do, but usually a period of even years where people have episodic vertigo that lasts for 20 minutes to several hours, commonly associated with nausea and vomiting, frequently associated with a period of fatigue, but almost always people fi feel fine either, either later that day or the next day. Uh, in addition to those vestibular symptoms, they'll have the following audiologic symptoms. They'll have one ear that, uh, they'll have a bad ear with, with, in that ear, they'll have a fluctuating hearing loss that can be documented as a fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss on, on, on an audiogram. And that same ear, they'll have, so I ask them, we ask, I say, do you have good hearing days and bad hearing days? Does it seem to be one ear more than the other? Um, they'll have pressure or fullness that comes and goes in that same ear. Uh, and um, they'll have a ringing or roaring tinnitus that also fluctuates. Classically, it's roaring or machine-like. Uh, it's possible to have variants of Meniere's disease, just hearing loss symptoms, which is cochlear high drops, and just vestibular symptoms, which is vestibular high drops. And of course, that's a little bit harder to diagnose. Um, and also, it, there's a lot of overlap with uh, Meniere's disease and some uh, migrative symptoms, so it's important to consider. Um, histopathologically, this is what Meniere's looks like. Um, there's two fluid spaces in the inner ear. There's a perilymphatic space and the endolymphatic space. And it's this endolymph, this abundance of endolymph that you can see over here is uh, responsible for this condition. Um, and it's called endolymphatic hydrops, is the histopathologic characterization. And um, in fact, that's the only way to definitively tell if someone has Meniere's disease. Is uh, histopathologically view their temporal bone. So most people do not uh, consent to that diagnostic study. <clears throat> so almost all the history is based, or almost all the, the, the diagnosis is based on history and audiograms and getting an MRI and making sure that there's not a tumor, essentially, and ruling out other causes. Uh, the mainstay of therapy for Meniere's disease is a strict low sodium diet as well as a diuretic. Sometimes the only thing I do for these patients who have had Meniere's and a, a, a confirmed case of Meniere's but poor control is really emphasize the need to um, uh, limit their sodium to 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day, and I give them a two-page sheet on how to do that and how there's way too much sodium and everything. Um, there are, and that'll work for about 70% of people. There are There's a conservative uh, management uh, device which uh, actually de delivers pressure waves to the uh, inner ear, has to be used every day. It's not covered by insurance routinely. Uh, but essentially for non-surgical candidates, uh, this Mignette device uh, is effective. Uh, and there's a variety of other procedural options. It's, it's sort of like a stepladder approach. It starts with diet or diet and diuretic. And the next step is usually, in my approach, is uh, intradepanic steroids. Um, and then there's a variety of other procedures and surgeries uh, to address the veneers. Um, some people just have a little bit of veneers and other people have terrible veneers. And so the disease, it tends to wax and wane. It can be asymptomatic for several years and then reappear. Um, in general, if the veneers is active, the hearing is gonna deteriorate and there's no way to stop that part of uh, hearing loss deterioration. Um, bilateral Meniere's disease is a much different condition than unilateral Meniere's disease. Uh, if I had to have vertigo personally, Meniere's wouldn't be a bad choice. There's lots of treatment options. Bilateral Meniere's disease, on the other hand, with both uh, inner ears affected is, is very severe. I think that in, in some of the older papers, it talks about bilateral Meniere's disease being potentially present up to 40% of the time. I just don't think that's accurate. I mean, I've seen, I'm sure, 1,000 Meniere's patients, and, and I can only count a few that, that truly have bilateral Meniere's disease. Um, and I think that's because we're better at, at determining what really is Meniere's, and perhaps you know, 30 or 40 years ago, 
Um, anyone with a little bit of hearing loss and dizziness was thought to have many ears. Um, so we talked about the importance of a low-sodium diet. Um, and uh, the more effective options also come with some more significant risk and really only are considered later on in the disease process. Labyrinthectomy, removing the, the balance organs of the inner ear also comes with associated hearing loss. So that's really only considered once a person has already deteriorated, their hearing's deteriorated to a point where it's not helpful. And then it's really an easy choice if they're still having terrible vertigo. If there is uh, useful hearing, then a vestibular nerve section can be performed. Um, uh, Transtympanic genomycin had uh, more of a role, I think, in the past as um, uh, deliberately ototoxic treatment, uh, but there's a risk of hearing loss, um, and so usually I only use that for people who already have some degree of hearing loss. Um, and this just gives you an idea of some of the, the, the anatomy of the area. Uh, this is the orientation anteriorly and superiorly and, and posteriorly. This bluish area is supposed to, uh, uh, I guess that's a sigmoid sinus, or the endolymphatic sac, removing bone of the endolymphatic sac, which is one of the surgical options for people who have uh, reasonable hearing uh, as a structure in this area. And then uh, a labyrinthectomy basically involves opening up the semicircular canals and removing the five balance organs. Um, Intratepanic treatments have gained uh, more and more popularity. Uh, and demonstrated good efficacy in controlling Meniere's disease as well as a variety of other inner ear conditions. Um, there's still a lot of controversy over how much do you inject for dex dexamethasone or other uh, steroids, when do you stop, how often do you do it, uh, and some of the same questions could be asked of, of genomycin as well. Certainly when it comes to intertympanic steroids for Meniere's disease or even sudden sensory neuro hearing loss, um, it has a very, very low risk profile and is reasonable to consider, I think, uh, early on in people who are suffering from these conditions. We talked about uh, um, the histopathologic finding being necessary to define Meniere's disease with a, what's called the certain category. Um, the definite category is indicative of two episodes of vertigo that last for at least 20 minutes documented sensory neuro hearing loss, and then these, some of these associated audiologic symptoms, tinnitus and fullness, et cetera. And the rest of it, once we get down to a problem when Meniere's are possible, it's really hard to progress with treatment because um, many people will have one significant episode of vertigo, um, but not a lot of other uh, symptoms. Um, so this is the hi historical timeline of patient, one of, uh, patient of mine with some more typical Meniere's-like symptoms. Uh, she saw me uh, first in 2009 with one year of classic right-sided vertigo episodes and hearing loss, which fluctuates, and tinnitus, which fluctuates. So her Meniere's disease, read the textbook, and we started with a diet and diuretic. And I think probably at that point all I did was emphasize the diet because I'm sure the ENTU center to me already had our own diuretic. Shortly after that, uh, her symptoms were under poor control. We did intratympanic steroids, which worked for nine months, and then another round of steroids but that was less effective. Um, and then in November 2007, or 2011, uh, we did an endolymphatic sac uh, decompression surgery. And uh, uh, now our symptoms are under really good control, but it, at this point, if she continued to have symptoms, then uh, we'd probably consider a labyrinthectomy. And this is just to give you an idea of what, a, what an audiogram looks like from a Meniere's patient. So left ear is the unaffected ear, right ear is the Meniere's ear. So this is back in 09. And there's a little bit of high frequency loss. And then it got better. And then it got worse in the low frequency. And then it got worse in the low and the high frequency. And then it, part of it got better and then part of it stayed the same. And then it got really bad. And so very, very few other things do this. This, you know, this audiogram that moves all over and people have, they hear really good one day and not the next. Um, and then the, the worst part about her hearing loss right now, and the reason why we'd consider a labyrinthectomy, because this is her, her, this is her discrimination scores from a word list from this previous audiogram in 09, so she's basically perfect, 92% and 96%. And then currently she's, or the last audiogram, it's 4% in the right ear, that's the mini ears here, and still perfect in the left. So there's, her symptoms are under control, but there was no way to stop that march of hearing loss for active disease. <coughs> 
autoimmune inner ear disease has some symptoms that are somewhat similar to Meniere's disease. You kind of think of uh, Meniere's, but in both ears at the same time, this uh, fluctuating uh, hearing loss, which is steroid responsive, but patients can't get off the steroids. So the m moment you taper their steroids, their, their hearing drops out. And this can go on for a while. And of course, it's, it's, it never, no one shows up and says, I have autoimmune inner ear disease. Uh, so it takes some time, but usually a pattern develops where they have steroid responsive hearing loss that affects one ear and then the other ear and then both ears. And as you taper off their steroids, you're, they will only tolerate uh, being taken off so much. They'll either need five milligrams a day or two milligrams a day. Um, most of these patients will have some degree of vestibular system, sy symptoms, um, and about half will have real significant bilateral vestibular loss. And so I'll go through this a little bit quickly, but this is uh, some audiograms that demonstrate just how that, that hearing loss fluctuates, both in the right and left ear here. The left ear is really down, the right ear is back up, and the left ear is changed again and again and again. So. Um, Originally presented in the right ear, but the right ear sort of responded to the steroids, whereas the left ear continued to progress. Uh, having a bilateral vestibulopathy is, um, can be a very uh, significant uh, problem. Unlike other peripheral vestibulopathies, people with bilateral, vestibulop bilateral vestibulopathies can have severe balance disturbances and uh, significant oscillopsia. That's one of the hallmark features. You know, if, if the world bounces when they walk, you know, that's one of their complaints. Or they have a difficult time reading because their head bobs with their heartbeat. Um, that's an indicator of, of a bilateral vestibular loss. And if that's severe, if there's not a lot of reserve in both ears, then that can be a significant problem for, um, uh, for their uh, ability to ambulate. Uh, it can be caused by ototoxic medications, bilateral Meniere's disease I mentioned, Lyme disease, otosyphilis. Uh, caloric testing is uh, helpful as well as a rotary chair testing. Um, and the treatment is in general vestibular therapy, avoiding vestibular suppressants, and avoiding ototoxic medications. Um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, uh, we talked about as a very, very common uh, condition with a, um, usually a very clear history of Episodic vertigo associated with particular head movements, usually lying down in bed. Frequently, people can tell you if it's to the right or to the left when they roll over, um, and it lasts less than a minute. Um, the dix hall pike exam is um, uh, almost always um, helpful in uh, identifying um, BPPV, which affects the posterior semicircular canal. Turn the patient's head to the right or left 45 degrees and lean them back in a head tilting position. If they develop vertigo, it'll be almost always after a, a period of a few seconds, there's a latency to it. It also has a crescendo, decrescendo pattern. It speeds up and then it slows down. Um, and uh, usually it's fatigable. If you keep on repeating it, it becomes less and less noticeable. Um, so this affects Primarily the posterior semicircular canal. There's a couple variants, cupulolithiasis and canal lithiasis. Um, they're very similar. Cupulolithiasis involves this calcium crystal, calcium carbonate, otoconeal debris uh, attaching to the, the, the balanced sensory organ and can be more difficult to, uh, to treat. So the Epley maneuver is, so either BPBV 90% of the time recovers on its own within a three month period. Epley maneuver almost always is effective at treating this condition and alleviating it. Come back and then they get an Epley again. It might come back a week later or it might come back years later. Epley almost always works. The first stop of the Epley maneuver is that same position for the Dix Hall Pike with the affected ear down. And then the, usually for a second position, I put people with their, their head in the center. And then this is usually my third position. Uh, and a lot of times by this third position or the next one, people will get a little bit of brief vertigo. But the goal of this therapy is to um, float this otoconeal debris, which is these calcium carbonate cr crystals, which are 
they're just weights. They're supposed to be attached to the utricle and saccule, but for whatever reason, they floated into the posterior semicircular canal. So they're supposed to be in this other part of the inner ear, and the goal is to float them back to this other part, which is um, supposed to be gravity sensitive, um, where they don't cause any trouble. Um, and so this is the last position of the Epley maneuver, where the debris is uh, floated back to the, the vestibule. So, uh, but I am paroxysmal positional vertigo, the historical elements that sometimes can be present, most of the time it's spontaneous, but it can be present with a history of labyrinthitis, um, head trauma, even otitis media, temporal bone fractures. Um, there are two surgical options for people with really terrible benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So this is one of the most common causes of vertigo, and I see patients with BPPV every week, and I almost never do this surgery because Epley maneuvers work. But for those folks who have really recalcitrant symptoms, multiple recurrences, can't go to the dentist, can't get their hair cut, really sensitive to head positions, then there's uh, the uh, surgery which is uh, most often used is posterior semicircular canal occlusion surgery. And there's actually another semicircular canal surgery, very much like it, called superior semicircular canal occlusion surgery, and I'll show you that here in a moment. Um, but basically plugging off that posterior canal and making it inert. Um, one of the uh, uncommon causes of uh, vertigo peripheral vestibulopathies is this condition called superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Uh, it involves the um, loss of bone over the superior semicircular canal and an abnormal connection between the intracranial cavity and the superior semicircular canal. Um, and it has some very, very characteristic and interesting um, historical elements. And um, it has a variable presentation, but once people have this, uh, either a couple of these, uh, these symptoms, there's, there's very few other things that it's just really characteristic. So people will have uh, vertigo associated with loud noises, which is brief. Frequently, they'll have vertigo associated with valsalva, with coughing, sneezing, bowel movements, lifting. Uh, and it'll be this brief vertigo where the world will spin. Um, occasionally, I'll have persistent disequilibrium. That in itself is, of course, not very specific. But they'll also have, they'll be bothered by the sound of their own voice, autophony, or they'll be bothered by the sound of their own breathing, bronchophony. They'll have pulsatile tinnitus with their heartbeat. They'll basically be sensitive to all these internal sounds. Uh, and that's because uh, this, of this mobile third, third window that develops with this loss of bone. Um, so there's two, two windows there in the inner ear. There's the oval window where sound enters through the stapes and the round window where the sound energy exits. And so when there's this mobile third window, the sound energy can escape into the intracranial cavity as well as intracranial pressure can affect the vestibular labyrinth and make your inner ear sensitive to um, uh, increases in intracranial pressure. And this is diagnosed by CT. Um, so, and very specific oblique images on the CT scan. So, this is a, uh, a normal uh, right ear with a bone covering the superior semicircular canal. And then you can see this absence of bone, this opening of the superior semicircular, this arc of the semicircular canal into the intracranial cavity. This is the middle fossa. So, there's a couple surgical approaches. Uh, this is the way I used to do the surgery. Um, this is the middle fossa approach where you make a opening here in the middle fossa craniotomy and uh, lift up the temporal lobe. And it, it might be hard to appreciate, but there's a defect in the superior semicircular canal. So it's this arc of the semi semicircular canal and this, this defect. Um, and there's, you know, there's a little blood in there, but I can't suction that out now, so I couldn't make the picture pretty because that would potentially put them at risk for hearing loss. And so here, this, the superior canal has been plugged off. And um, so this is, uh, um, patient of mine that I saw, a uh, 48-year-old female with um, episodic Valsalva-related vertigo, pulsatile tinnitus, and um, was bothered by the sound of her own voice. Um, uh, this is a transmastoid approach. So here the superior semicircular canal has been opened. It's really, really zoomed in here. This is like maybe just, you know, three millimeters from here to here. Um, and then that area is plugged off and this is kind of zoomed out and lets you know where, where we are in the, in the mastoid. The nose is over here. This is where the uh, temporal lobe is. This is the neck, and this is the, neck, um, the back of the head. So I might, I, this might work, yeah. 
So this is just the first part of the surgery where a mastoidectomy, just totally routine mastoidectomy is performed. This is the ear canal right here, top of the head, back of the head, neck. And so that's what mastoidectomies look like. Um, and I'll just stop that. And this is really, really zoomed in when all the mastoid air cells have been removed. And the arc of the superior semicircular canal is very, very carefully open so that it's, there's just a thin eggshell of bone over it. Um, and then that is manually removed and with an effort to preserve the, the membranous inner ear structure called the uh, membranous labyrinth. Is interfering with that could cause a profound hearing loss. Um, and then usually I plug off that area with uh, uh, a bone dust, some bone dust and, a, and a, a basically a tissue sealant, kind of makes a putty. So this can be, this approach can be used for superior semicircular canal dehiscence and for the most part it's an outpatient surgery, whereas the middle fossa craniotomy of course would be a more lengthy recovery. And a very, very, very similar procedure just anatomically right down here can be used for posterior semicircular canal occlusion. It's all done for different reasons, but essentially there's a portion of that semicircular canal where there's superior semicircular canal dehiscence or posterior semicircular canal um, with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo that um, is leading to the vestibulopathy and it's possible to make that canal inert and plug it off and uh, prevent the vertigo attacks. So, okay. Um, Additionally, iatrogenic inner ear injuries are also a possibility. Um, and this is just uh, a variety of ear implants that can end up in the wrong spot in the inner ear and a variety of surgeries that can be responsible for it from stapedectomies to cochlear implants. They can all cause vertigo and they can happen right after surgery as well as 10, 20, 30 years later. On this particular, this particular CT scan, this is a right ear, the axial image. This is the cochlea and this is the vestibule of the inner ear. And that little white spot is not a bone, it's an implant in the patient's vestibule from a surgery years and years before. Um, there are a, a variety of causes of uh, central vestibulopathies. In general, um, central vestibulopathies such as cerebellar infarcts uh, usually are associated with other focal neurologic symptoms, whether it's dysphopia or dysarthria or dysphagia or dysesthesia, anything that starts with a D could be a stroke. Um, and it's important to look for those other associated neurologic symptoms. Um, there are some, we talked about some of the differences between the nystagmus of central and peripheral findings, but I think it's really difficult to determine who might be having a stroke uh, on, on, on that basis. Um, Usually, these causes of central vestibulopathies are associated with other risk factors, whereas there really aren't risk factors for uh, the otologic manifestations or otologic causes of vertigo. So these are people usually with some degree of hyperlipidemia or hypertension, diabetes. Um, and in general, uh, people with central vestibulopathies usually have more difficulty ambulating, whereas uh, in, in peripheral vestibulopathies, usually, uh, although things are spinning, they can still um, uh, ambulate. Um, let's see here. Sudden, sudden on strips for, for strokes, usually with other focal symptoms. I think I have a better slide that talks about this. Vertebral basilar insufficiency certainly has many of the similar symptoms and other neurologic deficits associated with strokes, but of course, it's uh, um, symptoms by definition that last less than 24 hours. And a lot of times these can be difficult for people to characterize because these symptoms were there briefly uh, and then it's clouded by all the difficulty of articulating symptoms of dizziness, which may be significant or maybe not. So that it, can, it can be hard to uh, pick up um, uh, TII, TIAs from uh, the vertebral basilar system. So this is a patient I actually saw, I think, a week or two ago, 77-year-old female with a 30-year hearing um, history of, of hearing loss in the left ear. That's that's the excess here. So that's the left ear. It's been there for 30 years. She had a hip replacement, and sometime during the perioperative period, it became clear that she she had some confusion. It seemed to linger, but she was 77 years old and went through this long surgery. She had some. Uh, 
she's had difficulty communicating with others, uh, and it became clear that she had a right-sided hearing loss. At some point during that perioperative period, her family also thought, she thought she was articulating fine, but her family thought she sounded a little hoarse. She didn't have any dysphagia. On exam, when I took a look with an endoscope, she had a vocal cord paralysis, and um, it turned out that she had a post-op left cerebellar stroke, and likely, I don't think that her hearing loss will recover, and probably, um, she should probably be a cochlear implant candidate, whereas she was relying on her right ear now that, that that's dropped out. And her, these are word recognition scores. She has a very, very poor word understanding, but pre-existent with the left ear and now with the right ear. She had some uh, brief vertigo during that period of time uh, with, with her other symptoms in the postoperative period as well as some disequilibrium as well. Uh, so superior cerebral artery uh, uh, strokes less commonly have uh, uh, vertigo uh, when compared to uh, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery more commonly has um, hearing loss associated because that's the, uh, one of the main sources of uh, blood supply through the labyrinthine artery from the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. It's right in, almost always right in the uh, internal auditory canal next to the uh, uh, eighth nerve. Um, vestibular migraines, I, I, it certainly doesn't really fit with the, the discussion with, with strokes, but it's, you know, technically a, a central cause of vestibulopathy. Um, I don't see a lot of strokes, but I see plenty of people with vestibular migraines, um, and usually they're the folks who have episodic vertigo that seems like real vertigo, real pathology. They give a good, consistent history. They're not wishy-washy about it. But their vertigo, I lose them when their vertigo lasted, you know, one day was just a few minutes, and then last November lasted five days, and now she, you know, they've had three attacks in, you know, the last week of two hours apiece. Nothing in the inner ear really causes that. And additionally, they'll have many times either a family history of migraines or a personal history of migraines, associated photophobia, phonophobia, motion intolerance. So once all these causes, other causes are excluded, and the history uh, is kind of as I described, frequently these are uh, patients with, with vestibular migraines, either with a, a personal history of typical migraine headaches or sometimes with, with what appears to be acephalgic migraines, sometimes with a history of, of retinal migraines, certainly visual aura. And I emphasize uh, diet modifications, identifying triggers infrequently. I'll start a migraine prophylaxis for a trial for a month or two. Commonly, I use verapamil, um, but also uh, rarely topamax. Um, I just wanted to uh, revisit, since we've kind of gotten through most of the vertiginous uh, entities that we're going to talk about, just the importance of defining whether a patient has vertigo or not and the duration of that vertigo. It being less than a minute for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, uh, usually hours for Meniere's, days for vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis. Meniere's or migraines can be all over the place, and uh, central causes and cerebrovascular causes usually are associated with other focal, focal neurologic symptoms. A uh, few entities that I also wanted to, to mention, which I encounter from time to time, um, Cervical vertigo, you may have cervical vertigo or cervicogenic vertigo. There is no world expert, there is no clinic to go to if you want to seek out the world expert for cervical vertigo. And people debate whether it really exists or not, and probably it's a real entity, but it's, it's hard to know. There's no good diagnostic criteria. So usually these people who have uh, vertigo or disequilibrium commonly associated with head injury or whiplash injury, sometimes cervical disc disease, um, it can even present in a delayed fashion after the, the head injury um, and all other otologic or neurotologic uh, symptoms and, and conditions have been um, uh, eliminated, then it, it should be considered. There's no specific therapy for cervicogenic vertigo. Um, it uh, may be related to proprioceptive damage in the uh, cervical spine or abnormalities of the uh, vertebral artery. Vestibular therapy and judicious use of uh, vestibular suppression is usually the most helpful. Um, 
Post-traumatic vertigo, this is, um, these are, in general, the most difficult patients I treat with the, with the poorest prognosis. So um, vertiginous symptoms after head trauma, usually close head injury, and I'm not necessarily talking about um, uh, paralymphatic fistulas or endolymphatic high drops that sometimes can rela occur after head trauma. Any of these conditions can have, have, happen after a head trauma, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Those are all secondary treatable peripheral vestibulopathies related to head trauma. But there's this other entity of closed head injuries, post-concussive syndrome related to disequilibrium and vertigo. And for whatever reason, I think it must be because it's a multi-level injury related to their head trauma where they have an inner ear injury to the membranous labyrinth, to the delicate membranes in the inner ear, what we call a labyrinthine concussion. But maybe they also have a shearing myelin injury to a variety of uh, 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 spots in their vestibular pathways and their cerebellum. And they tend to have the poorest prognosis um, and have symptoms that seem to linger for you know, a year or even greater indefinitely. Um, vestibular rehabilitation certainly plays a significant role, uh, primarily for a lot of these central causes of vestibulopathy, but of course also for uh, specific peripheral vestibulopathies. Obviously it's key for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and some of the variants of recurrent benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or horizontal canal, uh, BPPV. Um, that can be very, or bilateral BPPV, sometimes there's very, very uh, challenging manifestations of that, of, of those conditions. Um, and just uh, habituation exercises and strengthening exercises that identifying areas of uh, vestibular weakness and focusing on strengthening those um, as well as um, relying on uh, the visual system, system and proprioceptive system to make up for some of those vestibular losses are important. Additionally, in a, uh, to, um, a lot of times for some of these folks and some of these older folks who have vestibulopathies that they can't recover from, um, determining whether there's a fall risk can be important. Uh, these are all conditions that I keep in mind, although I don't, I've seen them all, but uh, they're not frequent. Um, uh, Pseudotumor cerebri, Chiari malformation, cerebellar degeneration, and other tumors. Um, so I think I just have just a few real quick uh, brief case presentations, then we'll finish up here. So 59-year-old female with disequilibrium and uh, right-sided tinnitus, clearly not a really impressive audiogram, just some high-pitched loss, but just the asymmetry of the tinnitus that had been going on for a while led to an MRI. And this is just to show that uh, sometimes even significant posterior fossa disease, this is a large uh, meningioma in the posterior fossa, can preserve both hearing and balance function and have relatively limited focal deficits. Um, and meningiomas tend to do that. And this, we removed this meningioma, uh, Dr. Kerr and I, he's a, um, a neurosurgical colleague in Des Moines, um, through, uh, through a retrosigmoid approach. Uh, so, uh, here's another patient who had a 30-year-old female who over one weekend, a school teacher, and then one weekend she had a sudden onset of her uh, of severe vertigo, nausea and vomiting, uh, profound right-sided hearing loss, and uh, complete facial nerve paralysis. No movement whatsoever. And had been totally normal before that. This is their audiogram which demonstrates 100% uh, scores on the left side and she can't understand a single word on the right ear. And interestingly enough, she had a very, very small lesion in the internal auditory canal. This ended up being an acoustic neuroma, but with this history, I was actually very, very concerned that this might be something uh, more nefarious, like a metastatic breast cancer or something like that, because normally an acoustic neuroma doesn't behave like that. Uh, but I think that given this lucency, it had a, a hemorrhagic episode uh, just within the tumor that made it expand rapidly enough in this very tight confines of the internal auditory canal that caused a loss of uh, vestibular function and facial nerve function. So this is actually video from her surgery with uh, Dr. Kerr and I did. Um, through, it's actually through the inner ear, it's a trans-labyrinthian approach because she had, she had no hearing. Um, and so this is the, so we're oriented just like this cartoon over here. This is the top of the head and the nose here anteriorly, inferiorly, and then posteriorly back here. The ear canal would be right about here, 
some work very, very deep and through the dura into the posterior fossa. This is posterior fossa dura here. And then this is all tumor. Now keep in mind, this tumor is about, I don't know, eight millimeters by four millimeters. It's incredibly small. And so they're just dividing the uh, uh, vestibular nerve branches that is still attached laterally to the inner ear and then getting around this tumor here. This is the facial nerve here. And so, and this is the cochlear branch, the hearing branch. And so that, of course, doesn't work anymore. But the, um, the facial nerve, she actually made a very, very nice recovery over time, even though she had a complete paralysis. It ended up being a benign disease. Um, so acoustic neuromas, uh, that's really the, the emphasis of my training and, and, and uh, a lot of what I do. Uh, are benign growths so that primarily grow on uh, the vestibular branches. And this CT scan just demonstrates another way to get at them when the hearing is normal. That you can see here, there's a, this is an old craniotomy site on the right side, or I guess a fresh craniotomy site. And then this absent bone here is a window, a middle fossa craniotomy to get to that lesion, whereas the bone is still present here. So you can go through that window and remove the tumor and preserve hearing by avoiding the inner ear structures. Um, I think this is my, the last case I wanted to mention. Um, a 57-year-old uh, gentleman with uh, leukemia who was immunocompromised who had very persistent otorrhea and then over time developed more hearing loss as well as vertigo uh, and had an otitis externa that went to a skull base osteomyelitis. So this is all bone destruction where there's a nice external auditory canal here. It's all ratty and eaten up and invaded. And this is a coronal MRI. And here's the mastoid inflammation and inflammation of the dura and uh, destruction of the uh, temporal bone <coughs> and more infl inflammation of the dura. And this entity is uh, diagnosed with the aid of uh, nuclear medicine studies, usually a gallium and technetium 99 uh, to detect the osteomyelitis as well as uh, ongoing inflammation. And so the area of the uh, mastoid is uh, lit up in those studies. And so in conclusion, vestibular complaints are common. Sometimes the histories are straightforward. Sometimes they're very convoluted. It's important, it's important and useful exercise to determine what's truly vertigo, a sensation of movement that when there is none, and what is something else. And it's important to differentiate, is it, are the symptoms constant? Are they spontaneous and episodic? or are they situational, like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo? The duration of the vertigo is very, very helpful in differentiating the diagnostic entity and then trying to determine whether it's a central or peripheral vestibulopathy. Uh, usually treatment involves uh, the avoidance of vestibular suppressants um, after you get past the acute phase. Um, uh, and for persistent disequilibrium, the importance of vestibular therapy and for Certain specific peripheral and otologic disorders, often there is very specific therapies to uh, treat and cure these disorders. And that's it. Any questions? If we have a little, if we have time or not. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.